So hello, I'm Adrian Ballam. I'm a partner in the corporate team at Ward Hathaway. I'm just talking today really with Chris Silverwood, who's a corporate financier, um, in particular on the C-Bills scheme. Uh, the furlough scheme came live uh, yesterday, it's the 21st of, of April. So that seems to be working okay. Seems to be a bit behind on the, the C-Bills in terms of um, putting money out. So that was worth talking through and reviewing how, how that's going. So, so Chris, I suppose it, it makes sense. Maybe a yep. bit of introduction as to who you are and what you do. Um, Absolutely. So, my background: um, I was an accountant with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, spent four years there, um, then moved to to Rothschild to their asset-based lending business, um, funding management buyouts and transactional stuff using invoice discounting, planting machinery finance, stock finance, cash flow finance. So, really went from being an accountant to a lender. Um, and then for the last 10 years, I've been applying my own furrow in, in corporate finance. Um, that's involved raising money for businesses, restructuring businesses, uh, and selling businesses. And as you can imagine, when this pandemic hit, a lot of the traditional corporate finance stuff stopped with it. Um, so businesses that were for sale, suddenly people wanted to withdraw from the market. Um, where those businesses still remain on the market, the acquirers were... Uh, we're, we're bidding down offers by 20, 30 percent. So, quite quickly, the remaining ones that were on the market were withdrawn. Um, so, we decided it was time to to help our clients with some some Siebel's funding. So, we we all down tools um, and said, Let, let's concentrate. Let's get really gemmed up on what this Siebel's is all about. Let's be right at the front of the curve, helping our clients raise money. Now. For the first couple of weeks, there was a lot of confusion in terms of the banks trying to understand the rules that the British Business Bank had put out, their interpretation of those rules. And there was an outcry, wasn't there? Because the, you know, for the first couple of weeks, um, loans of less than a quarter of a million pound, banks were still offering personal guarantee, or still asking for personal guarantees. Treating it like um, a normal loan, yeah. And also they were applying the 80% government guarantee rules in a way that we didn't think was within the spirit of the agreement. So they were going to, uh, if a business stopped trading, they would look to realize all of the business assets, all of the director's personal assets, and then would claim 80% of the balance, which is not how people thought it would work. Yeah. So we've, we've got a number of clients who happily, if they were asked, if they were borrowing a million pound, would happily put their, personal assets on the line for 20% of that £200,000, but that wasn't happening. Now, there was a big outcry, and as we know, things changed, and now for loans less than £250,000, uh, personal guarantees are not taken, and for loans in excess of £250,000, personal guarantees may be asked for, um, but that doesn't include the principal private residence. And in some cases, in fact, in most cases, the banks are not asking for any, any personal guarantees. So it's, it's moved full circle in that sense. And the discussion now is potentially moving to 100%, but it still seems to be not quite there yet. In terms I mean, of I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I saw Sunak yesterday in his uh, daily briefing, and he just said that he wasn't convinced by the arguments for a 100% guarantee. He compared it to the likes of Switzerland who do offer 100% guarantee, but he thinks the totality of the offering of the UK government is far in excess of what the Swiss are offering with that 100% guarantee. So I can, I can see his point of view. And I also think, you know, if it's a 100% guarantee and if the banks are allowed 100% failure, then it'll just become open season and money will go to the wrong places and will support businesses that were ultimately going to fail anyway. Well, there's nothing at stake, is there? Really, it's the taxpayer is the only loser potentially in that, isn't it? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I just I don't think that I don't think that will happen. Okay. I think you may continue to tweak some of the terms of the current offering, but I, I, I cannot see it going beyond eighty percent. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, we've got got a list of six questions to to rattle through. Yeah, um, really around the practicalities. There's obviously been a lot on. Um, that's the factual how how you do it so it's more with your experience of um to the good bits and bad bits of it really to try and oil the wheels yes yeah. so, um looking at the first question so 
how are the banks actually making their assessments of whether a business can afford this type of loan? Um, in particular, with with a difficulty of forecasting, it's obviously very little visibility um, at the moment as to to how the business is going to look in in the coming months. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, we used the word unprecedented. I tried to stop using it in the last few weeks because it was every third word. Um, <laughs> but can you imagine? You know, you've been in accounting and banking for twenty five years, and you've done dozens and dozens, of hundreds of forecasts, but never have you put zero in the revenue line for the first six months of the forecast? And that's what we're doing. <laughs> it's just incredible. Um, now, the banks, they, we had a couple of conversations with a couple yesterday of sort of live applications that we've got in. And whilst it's absol absolutely necessary to do the cash flow forecasting to be able to establish what the ask is, so how much money do we need to borrow, no. They are not putting any emphasis in terms of their lending decision on those forecasts. They're looking backwards. Yeah. And they're looking at the last set of statutory filed accounts. So even though you may have got management accounts that are draft and pretty much ready to be um, submitted, they are really depending on the statutory, the last set of statutory accounts to work out the affordability. Um, before the music stopped, it's kind of what yeah. life was like. <laughs> but it, you know, but it can be quite a historic look back, can't it? You know, we're looking the one we were looking at yesterday. They are basing, so we're borrowing, we're wanting to borrow 1.6 million pounds, and they are basing their decision on some accounts that finished on the 31st of December 2018. So it's a long time ago. Now, luckily for that business, it's a consistent business that's been able to show consistent turnover, consistent profits, growing profits. So it ticks the boxes in that sense. Had it had not been in that situation and it would have made a loss in 2018, it wouldn't be able to apply for any, any Seabulls money. So does that um, actually affect what would be seasonal businesses as well, I suppose? It's, it's kind of... Well, I suppose seasonal doesn't really come into it, does it? Because within the full 12 months of an accounting period, that captures the seasonality, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so I don't think that's the case. But what they're tending to do is, is look at the business and say, right, what was the EBITDA? What was the adjusted EBITDA for the period in question? And then look at how much money you want to borrow over what particular period of time and then applying a ratio to it. So saying if the total capital and interest repayment in a particular year is more than twice the EBITDA, then we think that the business can afford it on that basis. Yeah. So they're applying those kind of ratios. Um, for a fast growing business or for a business in property development, let's say, where the first couple of years you're sowing the seeds and, and, and so on, and then the actual sales kick in in year three, you're yeah. in trouble really because it's not a true reflection. The 18 and 19 accounts are not a true reflection of probably what the 20 accounts are going to look like. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the forecast falls down in terms of the future, where, where, you, where you're going rather than where you've been. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of the red flags that, that banks are looking for, um, I mean, you sort of already touched on a couple there as well, but sort of the red flags that where they will or won't um, yeah. get with a loan, are, are there any particular themes that are developing? It's about good housekeeping, isn't it? And it, it is with all these things. If you keep your house in order, you're more likely to get some support. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's things like making sure that you've got your statutory accounts in on time, up to date. You've got some management accounts. You know, now really is the time to keep your management accounts up to date. So if we're in what we're in April, aren't we? If you're working on end of September numbers, the bank are going to flag that up as well. You're not really got your, your eye on the ball. You know, you need to be working on at least December numbers and ideally end, end of March numbers in terms of management accounts. Um, they, look, they, look, they look down upon things negatively if there's um, CCJs or previous winding up petitions or previous um, London Gazette notices. Again, you know, just good housekeeping. You keep your house in order. Basically. Yeah. 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 No return checks, no bounce payments. Um, Massively overdrawn directors' loan accounts, particularly directors' loan accounts that straddle a financial period, because it's quite understandable that most business people will take their take their income via a directors' loan account, and then at the end of the year, dividend that out, 
and start again afresh in the, in the next financial year. But if it's just continuing to build up and the business owes, or you owe the business quarter million pounds, then the bank are thinking, well, it's not really equitable what, what you're asking here. Yeah. Um, Presumably that would have to be subordinated as well. Anyway, that would need to sit behind. That's usually a condition precedent in the offer that you get. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, um, if there's been big distributions to shareholders in the last year, so you've just had a half a million pound dividend and you're claiming that you've not got any money, then again, they'll look upon that you know, unfavorably and expect you to put that money back in. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it comes... An island what's that BVI. If you have an island in the BVI as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We were talking about that before we came on, weren't we? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Don't expect any, any sympathy from us on that one. Um, and then the complexity of the business. So they like a nice business where all of the revenue and all of the costs go through one business. So where you've got a whole myriad of SPVs and joint ventures, it tends to put them off because they want to be able to keep a track of where the cash is going. And if so, you know, a proportion is going out to this SPV and a proportion is going out to this JV, then they're more likely to move on to the next one and say, look, it's just too complex. We're not here to help complex situations. We're here to help as many people as we can. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something to think about. Um, and then just thinking about some of the deals that we've done and where things have fallen over, perhaps um, it's essential that all of the directors and all of the key people are involved in the process. So if you've got one dominant director that's running the process and perhaps only got 20% of the equity and the others are nowhere to be seen, then the banks start asking questions saying, is, you know, is, everything, is, this, is this the right kind of business that we want to be, want to be funding? Um, and then just making sure that the, the finan financial information is accurate. So I've seen a number of circumstances where you, you present your stat statutory accounts, you then present a set of management accounts, but the opening balance sheet in the management accounts doesn't match the closing balance sheet in the statutory accounts. And there may be a very good reason for that, but unless you explain that, then again, red flags, what's going off here, you know, there's, there's not been a right reconciliation. Potential difficult questions, isn't it really? It may be completely innocent, but yeah, yeah. to make it as smooth as possible that you've explained it all up front without... Any... Absolutely. You've got to remember that whilst you're a customer of the bank, the bank are not all fair with your particular ways of working and your documentation. And us as corporate financiers, it takes us a good period of time to work out what's going off and working out how everything dovetails into, into stuff. And the banks are massively under pressure to get money out the door. So you just need to make their life as easy as possible. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of um, cost mitigation measures, um, and again, we've, we've probably touched on a few of these, but in terms of what should the business have already implemented prior to, to applying for a loan, is there anything again to set itself up for? I mean, we did, we touched on the director's salaries and, and remuneration, didn't we? Um, I mean, it's vital that you've already accessed all the other government support that's out there. So have you been able to furlough the staff that, 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 that you can furlough? Um, have you offered unpaid leave? Have you offered people the ability to, to work less for less money? And you know, reduce your own income? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah completely. I'll, I'll come on to that. Have you applied for the grants? So there, there are grants available from the local councils through the rate system. Um, £10,000, £25,000, depending on the rateable value uh, of, the, of the property. Um, have you sent back the expensive cars? So if you've got a fleet of uh, Jaguars and Land Rovers and uh, Mercedes, you know, have you sent them back to the lease company and swapped them for a, a Fiesta? I mean, it sounds crazy, but they just want to make sure that you're cutting your cloth accordingly. Yeah. Um, yeah, subsidizing the lifestyle there. That is yeah. essential. It's an emergency. Yeah. It is. It's a bailout fund, isn't it? It's a business interruption scheme. It's not to maintain your lifestyle. Um, and then, you know, have things like pay rises and, and bonuses been been deferred or put on hold for the next for the foreseeable future until we come out the other side of the pandemic because most people will be happy just to keep their jobs, to be honest. So <laughs> if they're looking for a pay increase or a bonus, they're probably barking up the wrong tree at this moment, aren't they? Yeah. So they're, 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 the, they're the kind of things that, that you need to ensure that you've already done before you then go and apply for the money. 
Okay, yeah, absolutely makes sense. So I suppose looking at kind of putting together that application, what what level of information should the business provide? I mean, again, we've, we've probably touched on it in the themes in terms of the forecast and the stat accounts and, and everything else. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything else kind of on the practical side to, to submit? Well, the first thing that we do is we do a covering note and we come at it from a third party that knows nothing about the business. And it's almost like a credit paper that we would have done when we worked at Rothschild, where we have a two page document that we submit to the credit committee that just breaks down exactly what the business does, what the key risks are, what the mitigants are and so on. And you want to hold the hand of the reader and talk them through every single piece of information that you're providing them with and the reasons as to why you're providing them with that information. Um, so that's important. I think that initial covering letter. Summary basically of. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is us. This is what we want. And this is the information that we provided to support it but then breaking each one down. Yeah. Um, and then of course, a set of integrated financial forecasts. So that, in, that needs profit and loss accounts, balance sheets, cash flow forecasts, and also make sure that you extend those forecasts out, um, mirroring the period that you're requesting the loan for. So if you think you're gonna repay it in three years, forecast out for three years. If it's gonna be five, forecast out for five years. Um, and is there any particular assumption for how long this lockdown is going to continue or again you're just ignoring that just assuming it's it doesn't exist or no i mean it's about just if a, if a reader looks at it and thinks you know what yeah you, you've you've made a good educated guess there so if you think that the the lockdown's going to finish in three weeks time and we're going to be back to 100 percent revenue in month two then you've lost all credibility haven't you <laughs> yeah. you know we're in April now. I think most people are making assumptions that things might start to get better as the kids return to school in September. And then they may build up towards Christmas. And then as we move into 2021, things might look, to, might look a bit more normal. Everything's adjusted and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you need the last set, of, last, probably last two sets of statutory accounts. Uh, the latest management accounts. Now, the next one, the, um, the director's assets and liability statements. It's absolutely essential that the bank can see what the major shareholders and directors have personally to put on the line. Right. But equally, you've got to be brutally honest in that and not try and gild the lily, you know. So it really is a case of setting out exactly what assets you've got, what liabilities you've got, and what your net position is. And you need to do that for all the directors and all, and, and all the major shareholders. Okay. Um, we also submit 12 months bank statements alongside that so they can look through the account um, and, and just assess the conduct. Um, again, you know, if you've not been playing by the rules, you're unlikely to get, get support in this. Yeah. And then finally, I'd just include a corporate brochure to, to try and bring it alive. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a bathrooms business, you're, your bathrooms brochure or if you're a professional services business, setting out all the services you do, but the actual marketing literature so that the bank can read as if they were a potential customer. Yeah, okay. And obviously there's a number of, of banks and a growing list of banks that are getting involved. Do they all have broadly the same requirements? I'm assuming it's sort of a set scheme. There's no kind of any that are easier to deal with than others? Or are they Well, all... I think we always say, so somebody approaches us and says, well, we need some help for a CBOS application. We say the first thing we want you to do is contact your relationship manager. Yeah. Now, if they don't have a relationship manager, that can be trouble um, because yeah. you're just going to go into the sausage machine. Yeah. Um, well, so so. We, we, we've, we've really concentrated on businesses that do have a relationship manager. Um, and that tends to be for a million, turn of a million or more, you would normally expect to have a relationship manager. And we asked that relationship manager to send us their latest um, list of requirements in terms of the supporting information that they would like to see and also their latest eligibility criteria because it changes and it's changing on a daily basis so let's if we're dealing with a particular person at Barclays let's get him or her to send us a list of the requirements that they want to, in support of the application and also the eligibility criteria that we must must meet and then at least we know that we're what we're dealing with okay that makes sense so 
in terms of the common mistakes, and, and again, these are all sort of flavours of, of other questions we've discussed, but the yeah. common mistakes that businesses are making when applying, are, are there kind of some, some typical errors? Well, we just touched on that then, not understanding the, the particular eligibility requirements of, of a bank. Yeah. You know, so in some circumstances, it may be that the loan can be no more than 50% of the previous year's turnover, or it can be no more than four times the annual payroll. Now, they were the kind of um, requirements that I saw in the early days. They're starting to fall away now, but at that, you know, at that point, there were those specific kind of, kind of requirements. Um, I think by far the biggest mistake is not applying for enough money. Um, so making assumptions in terms of the revenue that are just too wildly optimistic. We touched on it before, you know, assuming that sales are going to pick up next month and that within three months we're going to be back to 100%. Um, that's not going to be the case. I mean, if you do borrow more than you need, and obviously we don't know how much you need, but um, are there any sort of early payment penalties or anything like well, that? Well, that's interesting you say that cause in, the, uh, in the conversation we're having yesterday with one of the banks, we thought we all needed to borrow the money over three years. They said, well, we'll lend you it over five years but there'll be no early repayment penalty. So you get the best of both worlds in that sense. So you might as well go for what you can. Yeah. Well, then it's better to have too much than too little and come back. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the next one is <laughs> whilst we're asking people to cut the cloth accordingly, you can't just not pay anybody across the board. So people come along and say, right, I'm not paying my suppliers. I'm not paying my rent. I'm not paying my staff. Well, what do you need the money for? <laughs> the whole idea of the Siebel's is to keep the wheels of industry turning. Yeah. Um, so you've got to be seen to be doing the right thing and, and paying people whilst you can come to an agreement with your landlord in terms of perhaps a deferral or, or a reduction in the absolute amount for the foreseeable future. You still need to be paying people. You certainly need to be paying your suppliers. You certainly need to pay in the milkman and so on and so on. Otherwise, the whole, the whole thing grinds to a halt. <laughs> We're sat in the cash mountain. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's one thing, you know, the finance debts, they can get quite carried away. We're not paying him. We're not paying him. I don't like him. So we're not paying him. No other reason that I don't like him. <laughs> so it's basically prudent things are fine. But yeah, if you're yeah. you just shutting up shop, then yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, don't be tempted to, to put information on a, on a Dropbox file or anything like that because the vast majority of the banks are not allowed to access it. So you're best to create all your documents as PDFs, put them on an attachment. If the attachment's too large, then zip it up. Um, include the cash flow forecasts as an Excel spreadsheet, particularly where they're integrated so they can play around and sensitize it and so on. Um, and then the, I suppose the final mistake is so, um, including within your submission an amount of money for capex so capital expenditure the Siebel's loans are not for that there are other places to go in fact there are asset finance businesses that have got Siebel's approval but if you go to one of the major clearing banks and you're asking for £500,000 for a new lathe or you know a million pounds for a new production facility well that's not what it's here for um so you need to need to make sure that capital expenditure is not not included in it. Okay, well, that's that all uh, all makes sense. And I suppose sort of the, the final thing, really, in terms of the general tips. Again, it's it's almost the concluding thoughts on on all that we've we've said in terms of any general hints and tips to to throw in there at the end. Yeah, I think you've got to remember that that bankers have got their own professional and personal problems as well. So they're going to be absolutely snowed under with a, with, you know, with a whole load of applications. They're going to be sat at home like we are now, you know, with a, at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee with the kids running around and people walking in. Uh, so you've got, you've got to remember that it's not business as usual for them. And I think empathy in this process will go, will go a long way. Yeah. Um, I would also say that it, it's absolutely essential that you sensitize your financial forecasts. So you've set out what you think is, is the best case scenario, but just sensitize it with a few assumptions. What happens if sales fall by 20%? What does that do to the viability of the application? Because you can be certain that the bank will be doing that. So you might as well do that yourself and understand what the implications are in terms of the loan 
and the ability to repay. Um, make sure that your, your documents are in, the, are in the, the most friendly format possible. So make sure that all tabs are properly titled, make sure all the documents are properly titled, because otherwise if you just swamp them with a whole load of information, um, you're gonna lose the reader and you want to keep them interested and you want to, to keep progressing the application forward. As convenient as possible, basically, just to make it as easy. So yeah, um, and then also, um, many a person comes along to us and says, right, I'm currently banking with Lloyds. Uh, things, not, things have not gone very well with Lloyds over the last couple of years, so will you apply to RBS for me? I mean, let's just be clear. Whilst some of the banks may say that they're taking on new business, they're not. They're looking after ex their existing businesses. So your incumbent bank is really your only chance to get this Siebel's money. Um, now, things may change. You'll have seen over the weekend that Funding Circle have now got approval um, to, 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 to lend Siebel's monies. And Funding Circle have made it, have ex, you know, made it expressed that they, that they are going to be looking for, for new business. And a lot of it is computer driven and AI and machine learning. So it'll be interesting to see how they do that. So perhaps, perhaps a funding circle may be the exception to that rule. Yeah. Um, and then I would just finally say, you've got to remember that we're all in this together. So the banks are going to be looking to the directors and the shareholders to contribute something themselves. So when they're looking at those assets and liability statements, if you have got the ability to put two or three hundred thousand pounds in, particularly if you're looking for a loan of over, you know, half a million, a million pounds, then you're going to have to realise that you're going to be asked to, to put some money, up, put some of your own capital up yourself. Some skin in the game. Yeah. 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 Roughly, how long does the process take? If you're assuming you're as successful and you know you've got everything together smoothly, yeah. very roughly from application to cash in bank. How long would you say that takes? A couple of weeks, generally. And it depends what conditions precedent need to be fulfilled as well. Yeah. So the more complex the loan, the more, the more, you know, the more shareholders, the more, the more directors, the more subsidiaries and so on, then, then, then longer. But, you know, we're seeing stuff that it's been submitted. There's an initial conversation with a bank manager. The bank manager then does his credit paper. He then puts that up to the credit committee. They either come back and accept it or say, well, we would accept it if the following conditions were, were put in place. Um, so a couple, a couple of weeks, no more than that. I mean, we, it can't be any longer than that, can it? Because if it's five or six weeks, then many businesses are going to be out of business anyway. You need the money now. But there's a reason why they're applying for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's, that's all great um, know-how um, there. Obviously, there's the cases, as you mentioned sort of earlier on, in terms of, businesses that aren't suitable for this type of loan for, for various reasons. And um, I guess that could be another session because those are yeah. where well, you need to be more inventive is, is where you really earn your call in terms of helping um, perhaps invoice discounting or other types of facilities, maybe something for, for another session or for people. No, certainly I think as we come out of this invoice discounting is going to be a real big player in terms of getting businesses back on the road again. Because if you think about it within your working capital mix, the real, two liquid assets of cash and debtors. At the moment, cash is getting massively depleted and the debt book's building up because people are not paying historic debts and sometimes they're not paying current debts. So that debt book is getting built higher and higher and higher whilst the cash is getting depleted. The business is then furloughing the staff, they're then cocooning the operations and can perhaps just live on life support for the next three months. And when we come out the other side, there's going to be some big debt books. Um, and and they need funded. cash as well, like working capital. They need the money now. Yeah. And with an invoice discounting, you know, you can get a facility set up in a matter of days and you can get 85% of the outstanding uh, ledger in your account, you know, within a couple of days after that. So I think invoice discounting is going to be a real big part of getting business back on the road. I wish it was 10 years ago. It was, it was a similar thing. They were the ones. Yeah. Uh, It'll be businesses that have never considered having to use invoice discounting. And there's probably a bit of PR to be done by the industry because, you know, I remember when I was doing my, uh, my studies, factory was always the lender of last resort, wasn't it? It was the nasty thing that usually <laughs> was a precursor to an administration at some point. So they'll need, you know, that's not how it works anymore. The whole asset based lending industry is, is enormous. Yeah. Okay. 
No, that's that's all good. That, that maybe one Super. Thank you very much for your time. And, and in terms of your your website is is cashflow.co.uk, isn't it? So that's, that's the one. Could not have a better <laughs> <laughs> website at the moment. So no, that's I'm sure. A good investment that one. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks Lovely. very much. Thank you. Cheers, Bye.